Good evening. My name is Megan Stidman, and I am the president of the Harvard Business School Club of Houston. We are honored to partner on this program with the Asia Society Texas Center. We have global members from the Harvard Business School Clubs and Asia Society watching this program from around the world. This speaks to the international recognition of our speaker. It is my privilege to welcome the Honorable Kevin Rudd as the speaker for tonight's program. Mr. Rudd is president and CEO of the Asia Society and inaugural president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. He served as the 26th Prime Minister of Australia. He is the chairman of the board of the International Peace Institute in New York, a member of the IMF Managing Directors External Advisory Group, and a member of the Global Leadership Council with Sanitation and Water for All. Tonight's program is on China's Belt and Road Initiative. According to China, the goal of the One Belt, One Road is to promote economic growth. However, many of China's competitors have registered heightened concern regarding the initiative and its place in China's security strategy noting that certain projects may serve to enhance Beijing's influence over recipient states, as well as help China project military advantages across the globe. Mr. Rudd will discuss the commercial and military capabilities of China's Belt and Road Initiative, as well as, it, as, well as its strategic implications for the US and global allies. Moderating the program is Charles Foster, who served as chairman of the Asia Society Texas Center for over 20 years and is currently chairman of Foster LLP, one of the largest global immigration law firms. He serves on several boards, including as chairman of the US-China Partnerships and vice chairman of the George H. W. Bush Foundation for US-China Relations. Following the program, we will take some viewer questions, so please share your questions through YouTube and Facebook comment box. We hope you enjoy the program. And now I pass it to Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted that uh, we have with us tonight Kevin Rudd, not just because he is the president of the Asia Society and former Prime Minister of Australia, but particularly because he is a noted expert on China, just about everything to do with China, uh, US-China relations, Australian-China relations. And I know from previous conversations, this has been a focus of Kevin since maybe as a young boy. Uh, and uh, he did something that I utterly failed to do, and he's become completely fluent in Mandarin, which I admire if anyone's able to accomplish that. So as you said, Megan, Tonight, we're discussing uh, this discrete topic of uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative of China that was started in 2013 uh, to help develop uh, sensibly the nations along the uh, historic uh, uh, spice trail. Uh, and uh, it's been expanded, uh, I understand, Kevin, to over the China has signed maybe memorandum of, mem memorandums of understanding with over 140 countries. So my first question is, uh, as uh, you know, it's been criticized in the West and the U.S. Uh, for a variety of reasons, that it was uh, implemented too hastily, lack of transparency, no competitive bidding, that it serves primarily the interest of China. So how is China responding to that? Well, thank you, Charles, and thank you to the Houston Center uh, of the Asia Society for hosting this event. And, um, and thank you personally, Charles, for your long contribution as chair of our, um, of our Houston Center for 20 years. It's a remarkable achievement. Uh, and also to our friends, uh, Megan, through um, the Harvard uh, Business Club uh, in uh, Houston. Um, I'm a, a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. I've uh, spent a year there. I've got stacks of friends in the uh, global um, alumni network of Harvard. So it's great to be at this gathering, which is uh, brought together by both of these great institutions. Uh, you're right, Charles, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has uh, come in for a lot of criticism and um, 
uh, some of it justifiable, uh, a fair bit of it justifiable, some of it not. So perhaps the best way to answer your question from the get-go is to describe it as seen through the lens of Beijing. Uh, and then we can go to the question of how are other countries reacting to it. Uh, this was one of those proposals that was uh, lurking in the top drawer of Xi Jinping's desk uh, when he took over as uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party in November of 2012 and as President of the country uh, in uh, March of 2013. But when I say lurking in the top drawer of his desk, uh, it was there as a concept, um, not with uh, anything particularly fleshed out, or fleshed out around it. Um, and um, I think the Chinese had been alert to an earlier proposal by Hillary Clinton uh, when she was Secretary of State about the possibility of developing a um, new Silk Road. And so I think this triggered some um, analysis in Beijing as to who was going to get initial and substantive naming rights uh, for this particular mega proposal as it would unfold. Since 2012-2013, um, and the formal launch of um, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, in um, uh, Beijing in 2017, uh, a ceremony I attended um, together with uh, various uh, representatives actually of the Trump administration. Um, it's uh, evolved in multiple directions. At its absolute core, it was seen uh, in Beijing as a pan-Eurasian infrastructure building project. That is, it sought to externalise across Eurasia uh, what China had done in its view successfully domestically uh, for the previous um, quarter of a century of its own economic development. And the central thesis was this, if you could lay out the basic economic infrastructure, uh, then you would actually create the foundations for long-term uh, entrepreneurial activity and business growth. And from China's uh, strategic perspective, that would do a couple of things. Number one, it would create enormous business opportunities for the Chinese uh, infrastructure construction industries, uh, which had done a huge build domestically across um, road, uh, rail, um, uh, ports, um, electricity generation, electricity gen uh, transmission, uh, as well as uh, broadband for the previous um, several decades. But the infrastructure and build within China was coming to its own natural conclusion point. That is, the build was already very big. And uh, whereas with 1.4 billion people, to a certain extent, you can continue to build. The thought was, uh, looking at Eurasia writ large, which is another uh, 2.8 billion people, is how do you therefore create as it's a, a pan-Eurasian market for this infrastructure construction industry. Secondly, the view was if you create these economic foundations, uh, these infrastructure foundations, it's also going to uh, make those countries into long-term strategic partners of China uh, and economic partners of China. Uh, through what Xi Jinping has subsequently described as the gravitational pull of these sheer size and dimensions of the Chinese economy and market. And then thirdly, uh, I think the Chinese saw this uh, as uh, also an opportunity to stabilise Eurasia, where their particular view was much of Eurasia uh, being belonging to the uh, Islamic world, uh, and that in their view, uh, radical Islam and militant Islam represented a threat to China's security, particularly on its western and northwestern frontier around Xinjiang, that bringing development and economic growth would over time stabilise these regions from a Chinese very much long view of history. So when you ask how did, would Beijing view it and how it sought to develop it, uh, they weren't pure as, driven as in, pure as the driven snow. These were not US Peace Corps activists out there saying, how can we further peace, brotherhood and international fraternity necessarily. Um, they were pretty uh, hard-nosed about it, but it was a combination of being hard-nosed as well as seeking to de-radicalise a large slice of, let's call it, Islamic Eurasia as well. Good. Uh, and one of the other criticisms is that the, the very countries that they are uh, 
through the BRI process creates a significant debt. And following the pandemic in particular, uh, there's a real problem with repaying that debt. And will China therefore use their leverage their position to, uh, to be able to uh, be paid back in valuable resources, revenues, mm. uh, which would normally have gone to the country will now be flowing to China. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, if we go to the negative side of the ledger, um, uh, what I would identify as the real problems which have arisen as a consequence of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the one, Charles, you've just pointed to, which is in a number of countries, but on our analysis, not a huge number, um, not a huge number out of the total number of BRI participating states, um, that the level of debt exposure to China has become great. And the famous case, of course, is the Sri Lankan port, which um, the Sri Lankan government could no longer meet um, its BRI repayment schedule. And so the Chinese walked in and said, well, thank you, you can give us the port on a 99-year lease. Um, well, that may have made sense to the bean counters in Beijing, but the political and geopolitical shall I say, negative consequences of that rapidly spread elsewhere. China has followed that practice in some other places, but not a huge number. Um, but certainly indebtedness and debt obligations to Beijing has been one of the problems. Uh, the second, I think, in some countries, it's been the quality of the infrastructure build. Um, this has varied from project to project. Some of it would be classed as world-class in sectors where China has been frankly, quite um, enormously successful in its engineering skills. And the road projects are generally regarded as first class. Uh, the power generation projects are usually that way. But there has been critique of the quality of the build as well. But I suppose the other critique, um, Charles, is the, as it were, the potential for foreign policy and security policy manipulation of its BRI network uh, at a military level for dual use capabilities, particularly with ports and airports, and in some cases, rail links. And in some cases, the rollout of what we describe as uh, Eurasia's new digital uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, which is more likely to emerge with Chinese characteristics than American characteristics. And for all these reasons, uh, the Chinese initiatives have also generated a negative reaction as well. well in an uh, area which you know well, Australia, there's been comment that the Australians are particularly concerned beyond the economic on the security concern as BRI has been extended to the uh, many of the Pacific Island nations surrounding Australia, which uh, creates a, an additional security uh, issue. What are, what are your views on that? Well, certainly um, uh, Australians, um, like Americans and, uh, and like Chinese, we obviously have long memories. And we remember that the Pacific Island countries had a particular significance for the United States and for your Australian ally during the Second World War and the Pacific War um, and the war against Japan. And so these islands are strategically located across a whole series of um, sea lines of communication. Uh, between Australia and North America, between Australia and uh, our markets in Northeast Asia, and frankly, uh, through uh, archipelagic Southeast Asia as well. So therefore, from the lens of, shall we say, strategic lens of Australia, the strategic lens of the United States, particularly through Indo-Pacific Command in Honolulu, uh, this is a particularly significant set of um, island states. There are about 13 independent island states in the Southwest Pacific. Um, and what we've seen, I think it's fair to say that over the last five to seven years, significant Chinese um, penetration of a number of these states where, frankly, to invest in a single large project becomes very big economic news in what is still a small economy. And you would have seen also a similar set of Chinese behaviours in the um, micro states and the larger states of the Caribbean. Um, so therefore, there has been some pushback, um, in particular by Australia. Uh, one notable case was over uh, the uh, construction of a submarine telecommunications cable uh, where the Australian government effectively stepped in and, uh, and uh, formed part of a consortium to build a billion dollar uh, undersea uh, telecommunications uh, cable rather than have that project secured by the Chinese. So, yes, there is competition in the Southwest Pacific and among the island states in particular. 
uh, Kevin, it's also been said that uh, well, we can sit on the sideline and maybe question whether or not some of these countries are getting into the best deal, that the U.S. has really been out of the game, particularly during uh, the last four or five years. And that for many of these countries, it wasn't just a question of whether they should do it with China or have other options, but China was the only options in terms of the uh, provision of uh, significant funding and, and, and the terms. So if that's the case, what should the U.S. do? And uh, along with the other Western countries, are we really in the game to compete with China? And if not, uh, why? I guess the point of view of these countries is if no one else is going to help us, we might as well take the, uh, the option we have. And that is the excellent question, Charles, in this whole uh, debate, because the scale uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, notwithstanding the fact that the Chinese numbers are not transparent, um, they are at best opaque and in many cases invisible, uh, but if you try to aggregate them, as we at the Asia Society Policy Institute have done, in terms of committed projects and projects on the books, you look at the scale of this thing rolling out as between $1 and $3 trillion US worth of Chinese investments in infrastructure projects around the world, and not just in Eurasia. This is extended into Africa. It is extended into Latin America. Notwithstanding, there wasn't much of a silk road going from China to Latin America in the 15th century, but leave that to one side. We now have, by the way, an Arctic silk road. I'm not sure that the Chinese navigated the Arctic in the 15th century either. Uh, and you've just mentioned the South Pacific. Well, um, this Belt and Road Initiative is going everywhere. But the refrain I have from developing countries around the world, particularly my friends in Africa, 53 member states of the African Union, um, who are uh, infrastructure poor, um, inadequate road projects, inadequate um, rail projects, inadequate digital connectivity. There has really only been one country in town with a checkbook, and that has been the People's Republic of China. So what's the alternative? Um, when I go around the world, um, there is, of course, concern in many of these countries, in Latin America and elsewhere, about the degree of emerging dependency on China. But there has to be a competitive alternative. What I say to my American friends, both in the uh, uh, Trump administration and now in the Biden administration, is that the alternative is they're staring at you in the face, which is in 1944, you established the World Bank. Um, it's an American institution. Um, it's got its own balance sheet. It's designed to fund uh, development projects around the world. And it does so on fully transparent uh, financing principles. It's required to do, do so under its statute. And in its history, it's done some terrific work. But the problem is we need to scale up its balance sheet in order to, uh, frankly, become the alternative uh, source of funding uh, around the world. And when I say the World Bank, it's not just the institution based in Washington. It's, uh, it's the network of regional development banks. The Inter-American Development Bank uh, in, um, uh, in uh, of course, um, uh, Latin America. Uh, you have the uh, Asia Development Bank based in Manila. You have the African Development Bank uh, based in um, Addis Ababa. Um, we need to lift the balance sheet of uh, these, these institutions because guess what? They're good institutions. And Uncle Sam had a lot to do with uh, building them up in the get-go. Get that firing, the World Bank, and under Kristalina Georgieva's leadership of the International Monetary Fund, um, she has been doing God's own work in rolling out the balance sheet of the IMF to make sure that any uh, developing country getting itself into trouble in the, let's call it a combination of um, uh, debt problems compounded by uh, those arising from the pandemic do not go to the wall. Um, these are the two giant pistons of global finance, the World Bank uh, and the IMF. America needs to rediscover both at scale um, because these are ultimately good, transparent institutions which America helped form at the get-go. Very good, very good point. Um, one other uh, uh, BRI question. Um, 
as you mentioned at the outset, uh, one of the motivations of China, which is perfectly understandable, is that they had this tremendous buildup of, of talent, skills, and, and uh, building infrastructure. But there's also been comments about whether or not they're transferring any of those uh, skills, teaching, learning to the recipient countries, uh, and uh, as opposed to just going on in, doing the project, and leaving, and not perhaps leaving the receiving country and conditions to maintain it and that type of thing. And again, it's a valid question. And here what I find interesting about observing Chinese behaviors around the world uh, is that China learns. Um, like some of the early stuff constructed within the framework of both the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, and the earlier precursors to the BRI, which is Chinese um, you know, bilateral infrastructure projects in various parts of Africa, for example, is that if you do a, a trend line analysis of, of China's accumulated learnings, China becomes more sophisticated over time in dealing with individual countries, depending on the reaction of the host country. A small case study, Charles, if, you, if our viewing audience is interested, it's Ethiopia. Um, I um, got to know a, um, uh, a Swedish academic uh, who's a China specialist at Oxford who has spent the last 10 to 15 years doing a, a longitudinal study of China's construction of road comp projects in um, southern Ethiopia. And it's a fascinating study. To begin with, they were terrible projects in quality, in uh, non-employment of local people, uh, indifference to local communities, and they really acquired rapidly a terrible reputation. But she advised me when I spoke to her about this length, at length a couple of years ago, and she's been doing the interviews, going around to the projects, speaking to the local uh, community uh, leadership, is that you roll the clock along 12 years, you now have 90% local employment as opposed to fully employed. Uh, imported Chinese employment. You have local community development programs as the Chinese company then builds infrastructure within the town, not directly connected with the um, physical infrastructure of roads that they're building. Uh, to the point, and also China increasingly applying with some rigor local labor standards and local environmental standards. Now, I do not have the data to say how generalized is that learning right across the BRI system. There's often a danger in the United States, you know, where people say, ah, BRI, bad quality projects, everyone's indebted, and local countries are really unhappy with them. This will generate its own reaction, problem solved. No, <laughs> it's not like that. China is very clever at learning from all the mistakes that it commits, um, but it doesn't get deterred simply because of, let's call it, its strategic continuity in what it does. Hence my point earlier, uh, Charles, about the need for America to rediscover the phenomenal infrastructure which exists and is waiting to be fully harnessed through the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, again, a very, very important uh, point, which I've noted myself, that the, that we often pick on and we'll have an anecdotal evidence of one thing, and that just becomes a given wisdom uh, that mm -hmm. dominates the entire policy discussion. So let me just shift slightly uh, to an uh, issue picking up both on your expertise as well as your roots in Australia. A big announcement, uh, the US, Australia, and uh, the UK have uh, made a announcement about providing nuclear powered submarines. And uh, as expected, I think the Chinese have already pushed back. So what do you think about that? And is that the, uh, uh, I guess this would fall in, uh, when we speak of the three Cs, falls, it falls into the area of comfort of some form of uh, confrontation with China? Well, on the broader question of US-China relations and, and China's relationship with American allies like Australia, um, this is a complex uh, unfolding dynamic for everybody. So at its heart lies China's rise. At its heart lies the changing nature of the balance of power between China and the United States here in um, uh, East Asia and the West Pacific. I'm normally in New York, but I'm here in Australia at the moment. Um, and, uh, and it's those underlying shifts in the power dynamics which is altering Chinese behaviour 
And secondly, under Xi Jinping, we see increasingly assertive foreign policy and security policy behaviour, whether it's in the East China Sea against Japan, whether it's over Taiwan, whether it's in the South China Sea and the prosecution of China's nine dash lines, uh, territorial and maritime claims uh, against six Southeast Asian states, or whether you see it in terms of China's um, uh, confrontational approach with India on the Sino-Indian border. So these are, this is, shall I say, uh, a, a general phenomenon which American friends, partners and allies are experiencing right across this wider region. And of course, it goes beyond this region as well, as we've just intimated. And so what happens on the part of, um, of, uh, of the behaviour of regional states is that ultimately, whether they're conscious of it or not, is they tend to go in either of two directions. And this is classic, if you like, international relations theory. Our friends from Harvard who have been to Kennedy School live and breathe this stuff, which is you either get into balancing or bandwagoning. That is balancing with another power against China's rise to restabilize the balance of power, which has been disrupted by China's rapid expansion. Or you reach a conclusion that's best to join the China bandwagon because it's the rising power. And certainly, I've got to say, during the Trump administration, there is a view across uh, the, um, the countries of, um, of the wider region that the United States was a retreating power as far as the wider region was concerned. And so those two dynamics are still alive across wider Asia, balancing with the United States against China or beginning to slowly bandwagon with China because there's a conclusion that the rise of the East and the decline of the West narrative is actually a true narrative. And so you see both those dynamics at play across um, this region. Of course, countries like Japan, uh, countries like Australia, and countries like India are very much into balancing mode. That is, joining with the United States with, through the Quad uh, or other inst institutional arrangements. But on the bandwagoning effect, um, you know, there are a number of uh, countries which have decided to bandwagon already. Um, in Indochina, you can look at Laos and Cambodia, question mark in terms of where Myanmar under the generals will now go. Um, then there's a question about, um, certainly Pakistan has long been there. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, probably so. Uh, Sri Lanka, a question mark. Um, and prospectively, Thailand, a question mark. And per prospectively, Manila, depending on the outcome of the next elections following President Duterte's term, a question mark as well. Then you've got a bunch of other countries which are sitting observing all of the above. And that's my general descriptor for the rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, as, a, um, as a casual observer of uh, the team sport, which is American uh, tribal politics between Republicans and Democrats, let me make this observation. Southeast Asia is one giant swing state in terms of the geopolitics uh, of the United States and China across Asia. And they're watching the way to, to see which way it goes. The reason I answer your question within that framing, Charles, is to see the Australian reaction within context. And the Australian government at present, um, under the government uh, which uh, defeated my government at, uh, in 2014 uh, at the elections then, um, they have uh, certainly doubled down with their, uh, uh, the strategic alliance with the United States. It was robust under us. We had the deployment through Obama's pivot, the first time of American de uh, marine deployments in Darwin, um, and uh, a greater, shall we say, integration of the two countries' militaries. Um, and certainly we have Australian senior personnel operating cheek by jowl with uh, Indo-Pacific Command in Honolulu, the old PACOM. The current Australian government has gone one step further with this new thing called, uh, let's call it AUKUS, which was only announced 24 years ago, so we're all trying to, 24 hours ago. We're only trying to get used to the acronym now. To me, it sounds like a bit of a whale um, if you followed the movie AUKA, but, but it's AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, Australia, UK, US. Uh, and what's its essence? I'm still trying to struggle with what the actual essence is. It's a, at one level, it's a defense technology agreement. Um, but frankly, those agreements have largely been in place so far between uh, the British, the Americans and the Australians, so that there is a fairly seamless sharing of the 
highest quality uh, military technology across uh, these partners. At a different level and a more substantive level, however, it's a decision about the next generation of the submarines. My government commissioned 12 conventional submarines, basically Japanese type sub submarines, although they were going to be built by the French. The government here in Canberra now has decided to replace those with nuclear powered submarines, which will be largely built uh, in Australia but using uh, both British and American submarine technology. Um, so that's what's happened. Um, is this going to fundamentally augment the strategic position of the United States and its allies in this part of the, the world? I think that's still an open question, given some of the reactions which are already uh, unfolding from a number of other treaty partners. Uh, the French are completely alienated in Europe as a consequence of this decision. Um, the Canadians are asking why are we excluded from this um, and maybe there's a division within Canadian politics on this. Uh, New Zealand doesn't quite know which way to go with this um, and I haven't yet seen what the reaction in Tokyo is. So I think we're still in very early days, but that's the framework within which it's occurred. Uh, that's, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, you, you, you know, um, I think when uh, Secretary uh, Kerry went to speak on the environmental issues and we've had some initial meetings, the U.S. has spoken about the three C's, cooperation, uh, competition and confrontation. The Chinese have rejected that. You have your own, you've developed your own uh, proposal in that area, MSC. You, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Charles, for the question. Look, as the Asia Society, we do, we do a lot of work in Beijing. We do a lot of work in Washington. We've worked closely with both um, the Trump administration to the extent that we could find people to work with. Um, we certainly did so with the Obama administration and we're certainly doing so with the Biden administration. But also in the Chinese side, uh, we work um, also with uh, Yang Jie uh, the, um, uh, the Politburo member responsible for foreign policy who is Xi Jinping's senior advisor. We work a lot with Liu He, the vice premier, uh, responsible for the economy and the one responsible for the trade war negotiations um, with uh, Bob Lighthizer on behalf of the Trump administration and also Wang Yi, of course, the foreign minister. So we, we, our job as an institution for 65 years since John D. Rockefeller III established us way back when is to try and find a way through all this stuff. Um, as we say in our mission statement, our mission is to navigate shared futures whenever we can. So, but we are not what I describe as soppy eyed sentimentalists who believe that if we just um, sing Kumbaya enough in the morning in the shower, that it'll all turn out okay in the evening. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So, we've got to work within the realistic framework of what I, just, what I just described before, which is this changing balance of power with action and reaction from both the Chinese and the Americans and on the part of various American allies. So the concept that we've advanced and I've advanced, and I have a book coming out on this early next year, um, which is, will be entitled The Avoidable War. Um, it's a response to my friend and colleague at Harvard's book, Destined for War. So um, I'm providing the counter narrative. Uh, but it's anchored in a very realistic concept called managed strategic competition. And uh, the one, the 60 second summary is this, the elevator pitch is this. Number one, each side has its strategic red lines, whether it's East China Sea, Taiwan, South China Sea, cyber or space. We need to agree internally in Kissingerian type diplomacy on what are the non-crossable strategic red lines on both sides and have a mechanism to enforce and monitor that so it doesn't, the crossing of them doesn't inadvertently create crisis, conflict and war. The second category is not uh, strategic red lines, it's strategic competition, which basically says beyond those five strategic red lines, which have to be negotiated with some degree of granularity, in the rest of non-lethal national security policy, right across foreign policy, across trade, investment technology, across human rights and ideology, there's a full-blown strategic competition between uh, what America stands for and what China stands for. Um, and the third element in this managed strategic competition framework is what I describe as defined areas of strategic cooperation. For example, on climate and sustainability, where we have combined planetary interests in making sure that we all don't burn up. 
uh, global debt management so that we don't trigger an inadvertent global financial crisis through a failure to manage uh, sovereign debt levels coming out of the enormous uh, pressures on fiscal policy and revenues within fiscal policy because of the pandemic. So MSC, Managed Strategic Competition, seeks to integrate these three elements into an overarching uh, framework, sell it to both governments so that it becomes, as it were, a way of having guardrails in the relationship despite its inherently competitive nature rather than having a complete free-for-all, which frankly can be very scary on the way through. Before we get to the, uh, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, you, in your in your remarks, you talked about each country having red lines. One big, uh, one series of red lines, as you know so well, is for China's uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang. And uh, I was in discussions the other day about, particularly about Taiwan, about how the U.S is taking more steps to send high-level officials to Taiwan, uh, provide more support, military support, and all of that. And the, the discussion was, is that counterproductive? If China, if the concern of China is that really Taiwan is moving toward an independent state, uh, do those steps taken to make China, uh, uh, Taiwan stronger, does it not in, uh, in an unintentional way actually uh, create conditions that might create more tension over the Taiwan issue. Well, again, you're right, Charles, at the very heart of the five, what I described as strategic red line issues before that I ran through, Taiwan lies at the epicenter of those five. And it has done so really since 1949. And it certainly has done so since uh, the United States agreed with the Taiwanese on their um, uh, security uh, treaty back in 1954. And while that was suspended um, after uh, uh, 1979 with diplomatic recognition of the mainland, the Taiwan Relations Act of the United States Congress provides the framework for the continued American arms supplies to Taiwan to ensure that Taiwan is not, as it were, militarily invaded by the mainland. That's the legal framework. Um, to give a shout out to uh, President Bush uh, from Crawford, Texas, your President Bush, and uh, is that President Bush um, is often attacked uh, for various decisions of his presidency. His management of the China relationship and the Taiwan question in particular in that crucial period of 2000 to 2008 um, is, was really credit worthy. And the reason I say that is that at that time, you had a Taiwanese leader whose name was Chen Shui Bian. Uh, who was heading in the direction of one form or another of declaring unilaterally a declaration of independence as the Republic of Taiwan. That would have triggered a Chinese military invasion. That's how the Chinese Communist Party regard that, because they still see Taiwan as an integral part of Chinese uh, territory. And President Bush, um, uh, and adhering to a US doctrine of strategic ambiguity, that is, we'll not be absolutely clear about whether we will intervene or not intervene uh, in, a, um, in a military crisis between Taipei and Beijing, but causing the Taiwanese to conclude that if they do something really stupid, that Uncle Sam will not necessarily be there, and saying to Beijing at the same time, if you do something really stupid, like militarily invade simply because it's time to settle all scores, then you can't assume we won't be there. And President Bush was very clever in the way in which he dialed down Taiwanese enthusiasm for crossing that dangerous threshold during those eight dangerous years when he was president, but when, frankly, Chen Shui-bian was also president of Taiwan. So a shout out to, uh, to George for his, uh, his work at that time. And to conclude these remarks, uh, Charles, going to the present, I do not believe the current Taiwanese president, Tsai Ing-wen, um, has any interest in a unilateral declaration of independence. I think what's changing is Xi Jinping's timetable for getting Taiwan back. I do not believe uh, that Xi Jinping wants a military action against Taiwan uh, anytime soon, by which I mean this year, next year, or the year after. But he will be attending to one core thing, which is a further change in the balance of military power between himself and the United States, including the Taiwan, Taiwanese armed forces, so that if push came to shove, 
his PLA commanders, People's Liberation Army commanders, could advise him with confidence that if the balloon goes up, we Chinese will win. That is not the advice that they are necessarily getting decisively now. The Chinese are still in the midst of a big reorganisation of their military regions, the creation of joint uh, military commands between the uh, individual services, etc. But I am concerned not about the next year or two, but I am concerned about the end of the 2020s and into the 2030s, where unless America continues to, as it were, rebalance the military balance uh, in the Taiwan Straits, uh, then that would uh, otherwise give Xi Jinping confidence to preempt. Thank you, uh, Kevin. A question from May. You mentioned concerns about digital infrastructure that could raise concerns about security for the US, the West. What are some examples? Um, well, in terms of digital infrastructure, it's a bit like this. Um, um, China, as um, uh, all of our American friends know, has been in the business of using its, um, its um, pinup boy company, uh, Huawei, to roll out uh, 5G, fifth generation mobile technologies, um, right across the world, but particularly across the Belt and Road Initiative countries. Uh, at the same time, by the way, um, it's, um, um, it's also created its own uh, integrated satellite uh, network, uh, which enables it to do geopositioning um, entirely independently using its own uh, satellite network, uh, rather than depending on those of uh, other countries, or let alone being dependent uh, on um, uh, sat nav satellite navigation systems uh, operated out of the United States. Why are all these things important? Because it becomes part of an ecosystem for the future emergence at one level of a, uh, an e-commerce, a digital commerce network around Eurasia and beyond, uh, which frankly is Chinese control, the infrastructure Chinese, the um, payment systems for digital commerce would be Chinese control. And despite the recent difficulties of Alibaba and, and financial, Alibaba will still be part of that together with various other platforms as well. So that, I think, uh, lies at the core of it. Um, in other words, it's a big economic agenda. And at a security level, China, of course, having its own sec more secure network uh, around the world enables it to become, as it were, more robust in its uh, communications around the world and also use that network to achieve other national political ends as well. You know, uh, just to uh, build on what you said, you mentioned Huawei, and that's been a big, uh, big issue between the U.S. and China and the, uh, the uh, I guess the official word, a U.S. indictment of the, of the daughter of uh, the founder of Huawei and trying to extradite her from Canada. Uh, I, as I understand that, that's because maybe a Huawei subsidiary uh, uh, broke our trade sanctions on Iran. It, was that uh, one justified because of the actual issue or was it, as some would say, a US effort to slow down and, and stop Huawei? And that was just sort of a, a step in that direction. Well, um, being not being an employee of the Department of Justice, I'm not quite sure how to answer the question, Charles. <laughs> but, uh, but let me tell you, um, what you've described as the actual um, legal case uh, is broadly accurate. Uh, that the United States uh, has had a series of sanctions against uh, Iran, which are both national, in some cases, national sanctions, and separately a set of sanctions which have been previously agreed to by the um, uh, UN um, Security Council. In the case of these particular sanctions, that were violated by a subsidiary of Huawei, at least this is the American allegation, uh, it was against um, a set of American national sanctions um, against uh, engaging in financial transactions with the Iranian regime. Um, now, in the past, um, it's not just um, allegations against the Chinese on this score, but there have been a bunch of European and financial institutions which have been, shall we say, um, a fallen foul of American national sanctions laws as well. Uh, and if those operations have um, operations in the United States, 
that gives the DOJ the opportunity to, as it were, take action. But where it's differed from previous practice, uh, Charles, is this, uh, and I'm not an expert in this case, uh, I, I follow it to some extent, is that uh, when you've had violations, for example, by German financial institutions of American national sanctions law in Iran, what's happened is the Americans have slapped huge fines on the offending institution. In this case, they initiated a criminal prosecution uh, of uh, the Huawei, um, shall we say, executive subsidiaries, uh, executive management team, which happened to include the daughter of the Huawei chief executive. Uh, and when um, the Americans, through the DOJ, then used the extradition treaty uh, with the Canadians uh, to intercept um, uh, Madame Mung, is her name, M-E-N-G, the, the daughter of um, Ren Zheng Fei, who is the CEO of uh, Huawei, um, that, that then threw the Canada-China relationship into a tailspin. The Canadians nicely complied uh, with what was requested of them under their bilateral extradition treaty with the United States. And following that, the Chinese then incarcerated two uh, Canadian nationals. Uh, that was now more than three years ago, uh, one of whom was just sentenced uh, the other day to 12 years jail for spying. And the other one, I think the sentence is pending. It's called the Two Michaels case. So it's a real genuine, what I've described as geopolitical sanctions law, potpourri of factors. Um, I would hope that we could find a way through this but I'm not sure, given the current temp temperature of the U.S.-China relationship, that that's going to be possible anytime soon. Okay, thank you, uh, Kevin. Ram asks, doesn't China deserve to advance in its economy, technology, and strive to lead in cutting-edge technologies such as AI, genetic, pharma, automation, robotics, etc.? Why shouldn't China seek military edge? Sort of well, any nation, Ram is right. Any, any nation state is going to seek to do that. Uh, that's just what nation states do. Um, they've been doing it since the birth of the modern nation state sometime in the 16th century, um, whether it's uh, gunpowder, uh, whether it's um, uh, naval artillery, uh, whether it's the design of fortresses, uh, whether it's uh, the, um, uh, the uh, invention of machine gun, the birth of dreadnoughts, uh, so too through the evolution of military and technological history. In the case of China, um, whether we uh, like it or not, China's um, what's called um, Made in China 2025 strategy, which was launched in 2015, seeks to achieve Chinese global technological dominance in 10 critical um, high technology sectors, including semiconductors, including artificial intelligence, including uh, biotechnology, including information technology writ large, including nanotechnologies as well. I think it was when China did that and set out their national intentions of becoming the dominant global players in all of the, shall we say, um, drivers of economic growth for the 21st century, and to do so by national means, not just corporate means, and to cross-subsidise through state subsidy many of their national product champions. That's when the reaction started to unfold, and not just in the United States, but frankly across Europe as well, and a number of other countries, including Japan. Uh, and that's where that dynamic stands uh, right now. Uh, could or should China apply these technologies to its military? Well, whether what we like or what we don't like is kind of irrelevant. China's doing that anyway. Um, and I've got to say, in doing so, they've made a very careful study of um, uh, the birth of, um, of uh, US military technology uh, after the Second World War, uh, the origins of Silicon Valley, uh, which largely came out of the US defense establishment, um, and uh, what subsequently was described as the US military industrial complex. So without me making a value judgment about that, that's what China is doing. The critical policy question for the United States and its allies is, do you provide China with um, free and easy access to American innovative technology? Um, and that is where the United States has every right to protect its IP uh, from any external theft by anybody uh, and to impose whatever restrictions the United States wants in terms of the sale of particular technologies, particularly among uh, the most sensitive and most advanced semiconductors, which underpins everything else. 
And so that's why we have a trade war which has bled into, frankly, a technology war as well. Thank you. Uh, we have now another BRI question um, from Amber. What are the major differences between China's BRI and other infrastructure projects funded by the European Bank or United States Agency for International Development? Well, one is scale. Um, if I was to put together the balance sheet of USAID on the one hand, um, or um, the um, uh, what was, I think, called the, the Build Act uh, under the Trump administration, um, and then the Build Back Better um, proposal under the Biden administration and the European um, uh, Development Bank. Uh, if I was to aggregate all of their balance sheets, uh, I doubt you'd get to 10% of the BRI's balance sheet. <laughs> That's the first thing. It's one of scale. Hence my earlier comments about the World Bank. The second point I'd make is simply one of transparency. Uh, all of these other institutions are ultimately answerable uh, to uh, ministers, uh, to governments, but most importantly, uh, to parliaments, uh, to legislatures, to congresses, and are subject to uh, external scrutiny. In the case of China, if we were to go to the BRI website um, after we finish this call, Charles, and look for where's the aggregated financials and what the BRI program is doing globally, I think you and I would be a little disappointed by the fact that the website doesn't quite work in the way in which we'd like it to work. We can go to the World Bank website. You can basically navigate that within 20 or 30 minutes. Same with the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development um, and the other you know, development banks around the world. So the essential uh, difference is transparency. And there's a third difference, and that is the BRI, there is still a debate in Beijing as to whether it should be anchored in principles of sustainable development and, or whether China is, in fact, simply offloading uh, coal-fired uh, power station capabilities into a range of developing countries. And if you aggregated the new coal-fired power station being built and funded by China, um, it becomes a very large number in need, indeed, in terms of overall global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that is not possible any longer under the major development banks of the West. So if, uh, in answer to Ram's question, there are three big differences. Okay, and uh, one, let's see, additional question here from AJ. How much balancing of power could India, Japan, and other countries in the region do independent of the U.S. help? I think to be strategically meaningful against the overall calculus of the balance of power from Beijing's perspective, uh, it is the aggregation of uh, the United States, the world's third largest economy, Japan, and the world's um, probably sixth or seventh largest economy, uh, India, and the world's 12th largest economy, which is Australia, and their collective military capabilities and foreign policy establishment which makes a material difference from a Beijing perspective. Um, it has been said, particularly during the period of the Trump administration, where none of your allies really understood where Trump was going to take America, given he was generally uh, pretty toxic in his treatment of a whole range of allies and not just the Europeans, South Koreans, to some extent, um, uh, the Indians, and to some extent, to some extent, um, the um, uh, the Japanese, that India is, should be seen as a strategic partner than, rather than as a treaty ally. Um, in, those, in that period, and if Trump had been re-elected, there were active discussions between Tokyo, Canberra and Delhi about uh, what to do in the absence of a forward leaning the United States. Um, it would be a very difficult ask, uh, given that the aggregation of those three militaries uh, would not um, uh, add up to anything comparable to what uh, the Chinese uh, have on offer, but it was, still would represent a strategic, but most critically, foreign policy problem for China. So to be absolutely strategically meaningful, you need the aggregation of the four. And by the way, there's an active discussion about whether that becomes the quint from the quad, uh, if South Korea joins the quad and makes it a quint. But there's a huge internal debate within South Korean politics between the center left and the center right as to whether that's a smart thing to do. Okay, uh, John's got a PTP question. Uh, he said, and I know Wendy's written about this. 
Uh, Nick Kai has reported yesterday that China is applying to join the PTP. How does that change the geostrategic scene if the U.S. is not interested in rejoining? I don't know if that's the case or not. Yeah, it's a, uh, a hugely important question, and I'm glad it's been asked. My overall appeal to my American friends uh, is simply this. If the Biden administration and beyond that, um, the Congress uh, wish to be serious about its ultimate strategic competition with China in Asia and beyond, this can never simply be a competitive race between the two militaries uh, and or between even the two technologies uh, and or between the two foreign policies or even between the two, shall we say, human rights standards. The missing piece of the American jigsaw is um, trade and America's uh, membership or non-membership of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and engaging, um, let's call it, free trading East Asia into a pan-Pacific uh, uh, free trade agreement. Because that's the missing piece at present, China ultimately has strategic confidence that the uh, geopolitical and gravitational pull of the size of its market uh, as it enters into free trade agreements bilaterally and given its current application to the TPP multilaterally will simply ultimately, um, as it were, cause uh, the region ultimately to become much more accommodating of China's long-term foreign policy and national security policy interests. So the missing piece of the equation for the United States is the economic piece. It's the trade piece. Um, and I know the congressional sentiment and the Congress is rich, but frankly, America has been at its most powerful and its most prosperous and its most successful when it's been uh, leading the global free trade debate rather than hiding in the shadows from it. Uh, something I have said consistently when Trump was in the White House and something I'll say consistently when Biden was in the White House. So this, in my argument, um, uh, Charles, and I thank uh, your questioner for raising it, is the $6,000 question. It basically decides who wins the game. Um, are you Americans are going to rediscover the virtue and the value and the importance and the freedom-enhancing nature of free trade and become its global champions again? Uh, if so, uh, then the United States uh, can and will prevail uh, in relation to China's rise. If you fail to do so, it's a very uncertain century which lies ahead. Uh, that's a very good point, and I agree. I think our listeners do. But just one, we're out of time, just one final question. It's often been said that U.S.-China relations is at an all-time low since uh, Nixon and Kissinger went to China. Uh, you know that so well, and I'm concerned about that. A lot of people, uh, do you see anything on the horizon uh, that's going to change the trajectory where it seems like things are getting uh, worse in terms of the relationships and we're getting further apart. Look, by instinct, I'm, a, um, I'm an optimist. Um, and it's not because um, we just have sunny weather in Australia and it makes you feel optimistic like you have sunny weather in Texas. Um, <laughs> I'm what you call a, uh, an optimistic realist. <laughs> Um, and I'm always looking for ways through this stuff. Um, I do not see any openings uh, between now and the 20th Party Congress to be held in Beijing in November next year, which will determine whether or not Xi, Xi Jinping is re-elected for a third term and probably for life. If he's not re-elected, um, that would be a most dramatic political event. I do not regard that as probable. It's possible because there's a reaction against Xi Jinping's decision domestically to take China further to the left on politics, further to the left on uh, its political economy, its economic policy settings, and to make China more nationalist. There's a reaction to that at home. But on the balance of probabilities, he's, he's lucky to prevail because he's one hell of a, a Machiavellian institutional politician, um, not to be taken lightly. If he's reappointed, it may well be, having secured his re-elect and his reappointment, that the concepts that I outlined earlier in our conversation, child of managed strategic competition, are able then to have a, 
as it were, a new opportunity. And the reason I say that is because much of what we see in Chinese behaviours now and will see for the next 12 months are driven by the reality of China's domestic politics uh, and his determination to secure his re-elect. We're playing the nationalist card against the United States. It is frankly good red meat local rawhide politics. I think uh, we all know what that means. We do, unfortunately, uh, but I want to take this opportunity. Uh, our time's out, unfortunately. We could go on forever. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Kevin, uh, for your uh, availability on this important topic. Uh, and again, I think we and the Asia Society as a whole, we, we benefit greatly by your, not only by your leadership, but by your uh, extraordinary expertise in this field regarding China, because it is such an important country as President George H.W. Bush said for years, our most important, for good and bad, our most important bilateral mm -hmm. relationship. I want to thank Megan and the Harvard Business School uh, Club of Houston for co-sponsoring. And I want to make a plug for our, our next in-person uh, meeting at the Asia Society in our beautiful auditorium at 7, I th seven, I think, uh, 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 Thursday, September the 23rd. We will have Ben Rhodes, uh, President Obama's Deputy National Security Advisor, speaking on the question of uh, the rise of nationalism worldwide. So we hope to see you there, and we hope to have you on many more programs in the future, Kevin. Uh, on behalf of us all. <laughs> Thanks for the great work you're doing in Texas. And to all of our friends uh, through the Houston Center, it's great to be with you today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.